expelled for democracy. Hong Kong legislators are being purged, but they aren't staying silent. Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. Democracy in Hong Kong has been killed. The Hong Kong government is now firmly in the hands of Beijing. Last week, the Hong Kong government expelled four pro-democracy legislators. They were accused of violating the new national security law, a draconian bill forced upon Hong Kong by the Chinese Communist Party. It basically makes any form of dissent or criticism of the Communist Party illegal. In solidarity with the four expelled legislators, the remaining pro-democracy lawmakers also resigned. Hong Kong's darkest day so far. Yes, because it seems like things somehow always manage to get worse in Hong Kong. It's like a weird, pessimistic way of being optimistic. No matter how bad things seem now, it can always get worse. Joining me today from Hong Kong is one of the four lawmakers who was expelled, Dr. Kwok Ka Ki. Thank you for joining me. I know this is a difficult time. It's all right, yeah. It has been over, almost over. So you and three other pro-democracy legislators were expelled. Did any of you see this coming? Um, in fact, um, it came to us a bit surprised because we were told to remain in, to serve the Legislative Council about three months ago in August, when the um, government decided to cancel the election this year and uh, to extend the terms of the present next call for another year. But then three months later, the scenario changed uh, totally and the uh, standing committee of the NPC, the National People Congress of Beijing, made a decision without actually asking us to talk or anything and uh, to disqualify us from being a legislator. But if you really want to, you know, disqualify anyone, you should give uh, that legislator an ample time for them to, you know, maybe she, uh, he or she would like to talk to the government and ask why and to uh, present the case to see whether there's any strong case or any uh, good reason why to disqualify a, a legislator, so and so forth. But we were never given the chance. And once that decision made by the uh, same committee of the NPC, everything was actually being uh, uh, decided and no more rooms for um, talking, negotiation, whatnot. So that was a bit surprise to us. Yeah. You were expelled for endangering national security. Uh, what explanation did they give you about what that means? There was no one ever um, given a proper explanation or the you know, detailed explanation as to at what point we were told or we are being charged with uh, not loyal to basic law or not loyal to the SAR. Uh, but you know, there was, there was a case always you were told that you have not loyal to the SAR, not loyal to the basic law. And, and I think for me, and in my case, it's more likely to be to be like that. Although every one of us may have slightly different uh, charges, but you know, more or less my charges is uh, what I can uh, comprehend or understand is more or less like that, yeah. So why do you think you four were targeted? Um, you better ask them, don't ask me, because, you know, we all, actually, all of us as a democratic camp legislator, we are trying to preserve the one country to system. We're trying to get what has been promised by the basic law, what has been uh, promised uh, in the basic law, like, you know, we should have universal suffrage, we should have all legislator and the chief executive being um, elected by a popular election one man, one vote, and no others. There shouldn't be any functional constituency. Uh, and not only that, we should have our own system uh, as of the 1997 will be unchanged for 50 years. And we should have all the uh, conditions given by the Human Rights uh, Convention under the United Nations. But it seems all these promises 
has been, you know, uh, denied. And, you know, there's a lot of empty promises, but, you know, if you compare the situation nowadays to 97, I can definitely tell you that, you know, we are actually moving backward instead of moving forward. We are actually uh, further and further away from the real democracy and real autonomy. Do you feel like you're in danger in Hong Kong? We wouldn't endanger Hong Kong, but, you know, if you talk about our own position nowadays, you know, we never know what will happen next moment. So uh, it's a kind of threat, of course, it's a kind of threat to the democratic legislature, you know, but we, we never know what can happen to us. So in solidarity, the remaining 19 pro-democracy legislators quit. How do you feel about that? Um, first of all, I, I feel um, encouraged and, you know, I really felt the solidarity or the, the unity that we have, sh have been sharing for the past four years. But in fact, this um, decision was no, not made at that very moment when we were discussing whether we should join the remaining one year as a final year of uh, services to the um, Mexico. We already had the a kind of agreement that any of us, any of us who subsequently being disqualified from the Mexico, then we would like to you know, we signed on Mars as a whole. There was, you know, something which uh, very important because, you know, we, we, we tried to be united. We would like the people of Hong Kong to know that we are not, um, you know, serving Hong Kong as, you know, without any purposes. We have a strong uh, mission on us that we should uh, try our very best in the whole year that we should strive for uh, just uh, solidarity and we would try to have freedom, uh, democracy and all those things which is very important for us. And as we have made the decision three months ago, so we it's easier for us to make a decision, uh, you know, just last week because, you know, we, we had that in mind already. And secondly, uh, you know, we if we had only had a very close margin of whether we would be able to um, oppose or withstand some unequal uh, uh, arrangement in the electrical. Uh, we only have a very tight margin. If all of us stay, then we may have the possibility of uh, rejecting or opposing any uh, attempt to disqualify any of us. But if we have you know, somehow four of us have forced to leave the uh, legislative council, then the remaining 15 plus two will not be able to withstand any unfair um, agenda decision made by the electoral. So in reality, it don't have any real meaning at all. So that's why we have that arrangement. Uh, actually, um, way, way, um, um, before we decided to to uh, to to join the last year, before the opening of this year's uh, electrical section, which was in the mid uh, October, we all had that ideas already. Yeah. So right now there are no more pro democracy legislators. What do you think that means yes. for Hong Kong? Um, it was sad. It was a saddest day for Hong Kong. You know. Um, if you're going back to the basic law, if you're going back to the joint declaration between the uh, UK and the Chinese government, the message was very clear that we would uh, like to preserve the original system in Hong Kong for at least 50 years. So we acknowledge the importance of separation of powers in Hong Kong. We acknowledge the independent role of the administration, of the Legislative Council, and also the, uh, the judiciary uh, department particularly on the law court. Uh, but, you know, um, that hasn't been the same, uh, at least for the past one year, and particularly under the um, national security bills, uh, the government, uh, perhaps at the back of them is the Chinese government, will be able to 
uh, influence the uh, judiciary by they have the ability to appoint a certain numbers of judges to handle cases relating to the um, national security bill. So that means, you know, it is not a uh, double blind system. You know, they have a designated judges who specific role, specific role is looking to the uh, this kind of um, national security bill. So to us, it's a bit strange because in Hong Kong, all along, we are observing the rule of law. Although we really don't have a real democracy, but you know, people of Hong Kong is quite comfortable. The, uh, the so-called present system, or well, nowadays is a system before that the three uh, establishment has their own role and they will monitor each other's to make sure that no one is going to abuse their own uh, power. So if we, as a whole, the no more legislative council in the, in, in the whole year, you know, the government is actually without any real monitoring. They can do whatever they want, uh, no matter the, the, the bills or the funding application is really um, set, you know, benefiting the people of Hong Kong. It, it, no one care about that because even if you are not, even if the resolution or any powers to be passed is not helping Hong Kong people, it still will be passed, you know, without any difficulty because within the electoral, there is already 41 pro-democratic legislators and two more independent legislators. Um, usually the two uh, legislators will incline to, um, to follow what the uh, democratic camp has decided, but, you know, Number one, it's not sufficient. Number two, we, we can't predict what exactly will happen uh, after we, don't, we, we actually force the electoral. So how will the fight for Hong Kong's freedoms continue now? Um, we learn from the past ex experience, at least from the uh, fights against the uh, amendment bills of, of the extradition ordinance that we could not, and Actually, we never rely on one single platform. We have been able to kind of change Hong Kong, the whole history of Hong Kong, because we have, it's not only about the electoral members, because, you know, at that very moment, the electoral actually being locked down. Uh, we have the uh, input from the ordinary citizen, uh, which is very important because, you know, all the people, all street of work, uh, they, they just they just come to uh, support the whole uh, ideas of fighting against the ex these extradition bills. So we we were able to do so because we have the power on the street. So nowadays, if the electoral is actually without any power, any endorsement or any progress, then you know we we need to decide whether we, we should go forward and maybe need to go on the street. But of course, at this very moment, moment when we are under the threat and the impact of the COVID-19, it will be very difficult um, to restart the um, civil movement. And secondly, under the new national security bills, you know, this uh, public or the people who, who go on the street may be charged eventually by the government under this national security bureaus or the bills. So the life would be very difficult. But I think at this moment, up till this moment, the morale of the people of Hong Kong is still very high. And we have been actually withstanding a lot of impact over the years, you know, by uh, other country, like including mainland China, like the uh, Tiananmen massacre, like the 203 SARS. We had a lot of experience to deal with the uh, so-called uh, the you know people behind uh, which is controlling Hong Kong but we had that uh, experience so I'm not too afraid of that not too worried about that no. what can the international community do to support Hong Kong uh, I think the international community sh should continue their effort to support the people of Hong Kong and to we really asked for uh, the Chinese government to look into the whole situation and 
whether they are abusing their power, whether there's any reversal of this, a lot of this unpopular arrangement. You know, it's still, the international community still had a lot of role to play. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, take care. And thank you for watching. I know there's a lot going on in the U.S. right now, but we can't let what the Chinese Communist Party is doing to Hong Kong slip through the cracks. Keep talking about it. Keep telling your elected representatives you care about Hong Kong and want them to take action. And stay aware of what's happening. I recommend Hong Kong Free Press as a great source for all that's happening in Hong Kong. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.